let's uh, have a word of prayer and jump on in. And uh, if you need to get a break and use the restroom, don't hesitate. If you need to get a refresher on your cup of coffee, don't hesitate. Just go do it. Uh, it's fine. And we'll just uh, keep on keeping on. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we commit this time unto you. We thank you for the privilege of being in your word. And uh, Lord, it's a wonderful thing to fellowship with your, your children. Uh, we, your kids, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, came with a purpose and a plan to hear from you today. Um, Lord, if, uh, if we don't get it from you, it's, it's not worth receiving. We, we need to hear from you. We're your needy people, and we need your blessing. And as we talk about this subject of change, Lord, um, my hope, my prayer, my discussion with you throughout the week is that something good would come out, especially this hour, where change is so important and growth thereby. So uh, I pray the Holy Spirit would uh, correct anything I misspeak and that they'll be hearers of truth from your word and that uh, as we rely and depend on you, we know that your word does not return a void. So uh, bless in a huge way for your glory, for the good of these people, this church, this community, and for those that we might be able to touch with uh, some of what your word says that we're going to study this morning. We pray your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Um, there's this book in the New Testament called Ephesians, and uh, it has a bunch of chapters. In the fourth chapter, there's a, uh, I'm sorry, I want to go to Second Peter. No, I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. My eyes are deceiving me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, verse 14 and 15 says something about uh, this. And, uh, so I am using uh, the New American Standard, I think, um, uh, because the pastor said that's a common uh, translation here. So um, it's... Not King James, certainly not NIV, but somewhere in here we'll find the Word of God as he reveals it. Now, you do know that it's translated from the Greek, so uh, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit to have preserved it for my, my good. So uh, here we are in Ephesians chapter, chapter 4, verse 14, starts off as a result, so that says something beforehand, um, uh, all that's gone on, but we're not going to go down that sidewalk. We're going to continue forward. It says, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Tossed here and there by water waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. Uh, tell, that tells me we're supposed to grow. We're supposed to grow up. We're supposed to... Uh, be different, different shoe size, you know, we're just supposed to grow, and we're supposed to be different because of that, and so um, can, can I really grow, can, does that mean change, can I really change, can, can there be a difference, and uh, in, in one of my, my thoughtful times, um, I wrote this thing, and I don't remember when it was, but it, it's in my, in my files, and I'm going through and listening, and the subject was change. It reads, do you want others to change? Do you want others to change? Do you want to change? Are you satisfied, content, and fulfilled? Do you really want to change? The want to change is different from the will to change. I cannot change others. I want to change. I am willing to change. I will change. I am changing. I am relieved you don't know who I was. Phew. I am pleased you have met me. Uh, I am pleased you have met uh, to have met you on the journey. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Thank you. Steve, I don't know if you want to change. And if you do want to change, I don't know if you're willing to change. Because when it comes to spiritual growth, God doesn't impose his will upon us. He invites us to say, not my will, thy will be done. And uh, I'm absolutely confident that he will get his perfect will done with us. Uh, Philippians 1, six. be confident of this very thing that he, big God, that began a good work in you, he'll complete it. We're going to get fully baked. That's actually going to happen. It's a real thing. So, um, But 
Do I want to change? Uh, do, am I willing to be content where I am now today? Is, is, uh, am I okay? I'm okay. You're okay? I don't think so. I'm not okay. And uh, from what I see of you, you're okay. But uh, it's the truth. Uh, we're going to, in a second part of this morning's time, we're going to talk about intimacy and about being known. And uh, I'm so glad you don't know the whole truth about me because uh, I still think I haven't been healed of all the shame and guilt and all that other stuff of who I've been. And um, I, I, in many, many ways, I'm, I'm not who I once. I'm glad I'm not, by the grace of God, I'm glad I'm not who I once was. Uh, and I think I'm better today than I've been. And I'm hoping tomorrow will be different because I'm hoping change will take place today so I'm a different person tomorrow. Um, a year from now, I want to be a better Steve. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad, grandfather. I, I want to be a better counselor. I want to be a better friend. Next year, and uh, one of the requirements that the Lord impressed upon my heart going through is uh, for our staff, there's, uh, there's a dozen of us counselors there, and uh, um, I require each of them to have a growth plan. I mean, corporate America does that. Where are we going to grow our company? Well, I'm not too worried about the company, but am I going to grow in Christ? Am I going to grow Steve? Am I will, do I want to grow? Am I willing to grow? Am I going to get there? And so next year, I, I have the habit of writing down specific goals. What's going to be different next year? What, what seed am I going to sow in the ground so that next year this time I'll be different? And uh, probably the most important seed is the word of God. We read, but speaking the truth, God's word, in love, that's the qualifier. How are you doing it? You know, I can preach truth, but not always in the agape love friendship kind of way. And uh, I can do damage. You know, I came out of the first church I was in was one of the most legalistic churches uh, that, I, that I've known about. And uh, they sowed the gospel seed, man. They, they, they got, must be born again. They sowed it. And when I went to our, our seminary, uh, some people thought that was legalistic at the time. You have no idea what I came from in the, in the first church and how, how strict they were about things and, and rules that were extra biblical, but they were rules none the same. And so I, I want to grow out of that legalism. I want to study the word and share it in truth and, and experience it in a, in a loving kind of way. So I want people to look at you and me and, and see the joy of the Lord doesn't mean we're not without suffering because you know the motto we had yesterday, trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and troubles. Uh, but we, we want gooder now. So in the truth, in love, I'm going to be different. I, I really do want change. And if, there, if there's nothing else that you leave this morning with, I'd love you to leave with the ideas. I've got to have a growth program. So next year this time, I'm not like this year this time. That would be a good deal. So I'm hoping that we'll, we'll do the growth thing. And uh, as we do growth, um, I, I understand that between now and next year this time, there will be change. There, you're not going to, there's no such thing as stagnant. You're either going to deteriorate or you're going to grow. It's one, one way or the other. And uh, so it's inevitable. I'm either going to grow or I'm going to die. A slow death, you know, everything deteriorates. Um, I don't want to die spiritually. I want to prosper spiritually. I want good growth. It's a big deal to me. So... Um, so if I do that, what is, what is that change or growth we're looking for? What kind of uh, change are you looking for? Um, how, how I know next year, you know, I'll be a little bit older, and uh, I got a good health report this year, but I don't know if I'll, I, I won't have more hair. I might have less. Um, I, I don't think I want to get any taller. I may shrink a little bit more. Um, I, I, I may not stay as trim and say, well, you're not that trim now. Yeah, but I could get worse next year. Um, uh, this year's been a good year. I've lost a couple, not as many as I wanted, but I didn't gain. So, that, you know, I'm heading in a good direction on the scale uh, so far. But this year's not over yet, and holidays are coming. So I don't know at the end of the year will I have maintained my good narrowing growth or expansion. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm conscious of it more than more. If I'm going to grow thereby, how are you going to grow? What's going to grow? And when I talk to the counselors, I ask them, they've got to, they've got to identify different areas of growth. 
growth, um, personal growth, professional growth, spiritual growth, family growth. You know, wh what are you going to do in your family that's going to help this? So what are you going to do in your ministry? Um, they're all going to different trainings. You know, well, I'm going to get trained. Uh, trauma is a big deal with the floods and everything else. It's a big deal now. There's a lot of trauma going on. Uh, am, I, am I really helping the people? Am I meeting where they are? What stupid things did I say last time that I'll never say again? What good things can I add to my vocabulary so when I say this, they're receiving comfort? So they're learning, they're growing, they're expanding their ministry. And uh, uh, we don't have any real young newbies. Uh, there's one young lady, she's in her early 30s. The rest of us uh, in the counseling center are, are more aged, aged. And uh, we're all interested in growing. And it's like if you're not interested in growing, if you don't hand in your growth program, you're not one of us. You have to go somewhere else where status quo, pause button works because it doesn't work here because the Word of God teaches me I need change. So how am I going to change? And uh, a lot of the, the growth that I t is like restorative because of the damage that has been done through the years. I I'm, I'm still broken. I mean, I'm not as good as I look, but you think I look good, uh, you know, or like present something. Or at least I've convinced uh, Kevin the, to believe the lie that I'm okay and I can preach at your church and I won't do new damage or something. Uh, I, he, he, you know, he must think something okay about me to have me again because uh, I was there in the former church. So he trusted that I, I didn't go off the, the heretical side too bad. Um, I, I, I'm wondering, are you really intent to say, okay, so how can I grow at my station in life? How, God has me here for a reason. What's the reason? Am I willing to fulfill his will for my life? Please, 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 please know that if you're still here, there's work to be done. Uh, you know, uh, there's no such thing as retirement for me. I can't find it in scriptures, looked all over it. It may change. I may not work so much in, in the, the counseling ministry as I turn it over to qualified people that have experience that I trust. I, I've talked about, well, I'm going to do more work in my local church because, or, or travel. I've loved to teach. Uh, I had the privilege of going down to Chile, had the privilege of being in Peru um, for a week each, teaching seminary professors and ecclesiastical people and uh, um, the uh, hierarchy of education, and uh, they, are, they are half a century behind us. They don't understand grieving like you and I know there's stages of grief. That's a foreign entity to them. They, they don't understand, and we're going to talk about uh, tomorrow, about what's the role of a father, uh, of a husband, what's the role of a wife. We're going to hit all those things, and I asked Pastor, when, when I came here, can I, hit, can I, can I just, just go for it? How deep do you want me to go? How, how intimate do you want me to be? And um, so uh, he'll take full blame for it. Uh, I'm going to talk, you'll see later today when we talk about intimacy, we're going to talk about the tough stuff because uh, it's, it's hard to go there. And uh, I want to get better at that next year. And I'm, I'm looking forward to an expanding ministry in different capacities because God's not done with me. Is he done with you? No. So what's your growth plan this year? And the week between Christmas and New Year's, I think God gave me that week, in, you know, from, from the 25th to the 1st. It's like one solid week there where during that time, it's the time of reflections. The Jewish people between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have the uh, 10 days of reflection. And to think about where have I been? God has me. Where am I going to go? Where am I going to grow? What does God want from me? So what are some of the areas that I need to talk about? I do want to grow spiritually. Now, I understand that if I get more knowledge, knowledge puffs up. So I don't want just more knowledge. That, that's scary. And, uh, and that's one of the scary things about all of the goofy letters that are after my name. And uh, someone asked me, why do you put all those letters after your name? I said, because once you're licensed by the state, when you do ministry, when you do counseling, you're required to identify yourself as a licensed counselor. So when you screw up, they know they can sue you and you can lose your license. <sighs> really? Isn't that sweet? So uh, I'm required... To identify myself as a certified licensed counselor if I do any kind of counseling kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I don't want to get fined for not doing it or be on probation. So you can find out. So if I, when I mess up today, you can call the state of New Jersey and Pennsylvania and have my license revoked. So, but knowledge puffs up. You go, Whoa, look at all those letters. I said, doesn't mean a whole lot to a whole lot of people, really. What what means is how much of this can we share together and have the Holy Spirit apply to your heart, which I'm very dependent on. So if we're doing that, then where's the growth? What kind of growth? So I do want to grow spiritually, not just knowledgely. Um, I want to uh, have better health physically. Some people that are hurt and broken need physical healing. Uh, some people that need medical healing. Uh, some people need... Uh, um, any, any number of different kinds of growth. Some, uh, if we kind of cut it in slices, some people need psychological healing. 
Um, some people need uh, biological healing. There's all kinds of different healings, and I don't know what your ailments are. I'm so glad that God gave me glasses to help my eye healing uh, so I can see you better. I learn I, I can't drive at night without this unless I get surgery, and the, the eye doctor says, you can't have surgery. Why not? Your eyes are too healthy. You need some cataracts, and then we could fix your eyes. Oh, so I should pray for cataracts so I can have surgery and not eat my glasses. Well, I didn't say it that way, but, uh, you know, so there's that challenge. Uh, but I would like to God to give me better eyesight, but I'm okay. I can see you fine. You look great this morning. You know, I, most of you look like you already had your first cup of coffee, so at break you can have another. I hear there's great treats, um, so we, we still want to grow. Now, if we do this growing thing, what has changed? What's the change we looking like? The scripture says to the man in John chapter 5, when he was uh, born 38 years, he, uh, God said to him, do you want to be healed? Jesus comes along. Could you imagine if Jesus said to me, hey, would you like new eyes? Whoa. Do you, want, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? Different translation, same concept. And do you remember what the guy said? It, it boggles my mind. Now, I, I still believe at that time Jesus was somewhat known because he's, he's out there. It's not John chapter 2 at the marriage feast where nobody knew him. This is, this is later on, a couple of chapters later, and people know who he is. I mean, Nicodemus had already come and said, hey, you know, what do I have to do to, you know, and, and now he's in chapter 5 and he's saying, do you want to be healed? And what's the guy say? Um, it's not fair. Someone cuts in line in front of me. Somebody always beats me to the pool when the healing takes place. I was at that pool. It was a mystical spirit experience to be at that pool where this healing was supposedly have happened in Bible times. But uh, Jesus says to him, do you want to be healed? And he says, it's not fair if somebody always cuts in front. Jesus didn't say if life was fair. Jesus didn't say if someone cutting in line in front of you. Uh, what's the, what else does the guy say? The guy says, uh, I don't have anybody to help me. And Jesus doesn't say, uh, I, I came to help you. He asked it, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? And I think sometimes we can be the same way. Do I want to be healed? No. And some of us, now we wouldn't say it this way, but this is real truth. And I don't mean to be offensive, I promise you I don't, but some of us have this victim mindset. Like, you know, I, I'm a victim, for, I've been victimized when I was a little kid, I was victimized by my siblings, by my parents, in school, in life, even, even my, my husband, my wife, they, you know, I just feel like a victim. And so, do you want to be made well? Oh, no. So our victimization serves as a, a reason for us to stay broke. And I'll tell you why. I, I wish we could have a different mindset. When Jesus comes to us and the Holy Spirit ministers to us and God says to you, do you want to be healed? Yes, sign me up. Please wake me up. Sign me up. I, I want to be healed. I want to be made new. I want to be different. I want a growth program. I want healing. Now, as amazing as it is to me, the guy, when, would you like to be healed? Someone cuts in line. Nobody's here to help me. Someone always beats me to the water. I don't see in my Bible he, the guy ever says yes. I'd like to be healed. But you know something amazing about God? God healed him anyway. He didn't have a choice. He didn't say, well, Jesus didn't say, well, should I or shouldn't I? Jesus said, he's getting healed whether he likes it or not. What an impact. Now, what I want you and me to be like, I don't want to be the victim. I don't want to say someone's always cutting in the line. I don't say I have somebody there to help me. I just want to, God says, God, do you want to be healed? Do you want to change? Do you want to grow there? By yes, please, Lord Jesus. Any, any healing that you would choose to bless me with, I will have great gratitude. And when people do get answers to prayer, I don't know about you, we have a, a crew of prayer warriors. I got a text this morning. I got some people praying for us today. Awesome. Awesome. Now, they don't know the outline. This is a new outline. If someone says, this is, have I done this before? No. I, I can't rebake left yesterday's food. I, I, I just tried that a couple of times. So the materials I've, I've been for, but this is a whole new outline for this weekend. Just what God would impress upon my heart for, for you and for me to grow thereby. And so this, this is what I'm doing. It's, it's just the way I, I keep growing in the word. I don't go to an old file, dust it off, and say, let's do this again. Um, it, it's just where God, I can't do that for some reason. I don't feel led of the spirit. I want to grow thereby. So I'm wondering whether you do ministry the same way over and over again or there's new growth. Because when he asks me, do I want to be healed, I'm going to fall down on my knees and worship him and say, yes, please, Lord Jesus, I want to be healed. That's change. It's a big deal. It's a real big deal. So I do want to be healed. And in order to do that, what we read in uh, Ephesians says we have to believe the truth, the true truth. 
And uh, it's kind of like Christian Christians. One's a modifier, the other is a noun. Um, I love to meet Christian Christians. Because there are a lot of Christians around. But they're not all Christian Christians. It's like when someone that I absolutely know for sure is born again. And uh, they're on the way to heaven. I know the scriptures and I'm born again. And, and uh, Dr. Steve, uh, I'm not a Christian. Said, You're not a Christian? I said, well, here, let me share the gospel with you. No, 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 that's, that's not what I'm saying. Well, what do you mean? He says, I'm not a Christian because Christians follow Jesus. And I'm in rebellion. I'm not following Jesus. I don't even want to be like Jesus today. Now I'm born again. And I know it's sin. And I'm in rebellion. But I'm not a Christian Christian today. Wow. Do you know? Who, now, you know, this is what's going on inside me. Do you know what you're messing with? In the beginning, God, God. Do you know what you're messing with? Creator God. I appreciate his honesty. He wasn't a very Christian Christian. But he said, I'm born again. I absolutely know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. This is even the one I'm committing today of rebellion. Wow. Do you want to be healed? Do you want change? Because what you sow, you reap. That's, that's very concerning. Very, very concerning for me. So I want to believe true truth. I want to know that the, what, the, what God intended, not, not what I, my life experience in 2018 in, in the United States of America and in, in Maryland. I, I don't want to know my version of the truth. I want to know true truth. And I'm always interested, what heresies have I believed? Because I did have believed some. There are so many different doctrines. And say, what, what's, what's the true truth? And, how do, and, and I go to the bottom line. If I'm going to change... I'm dependent on true truth, and true truth is the truth that says in the great commandment, love the Lord thy God. How? With all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with, with all my body, with, with, with everything I have. I, I, I want to love God with all of me. And the second one, second commandment. Love thy neighbor. How are you loving your neighbor today? Like you lo- and I'm not sure I love myself every day. I, that doesn't make sense. You know, I hate myself, so I'll cut myself. People are in pain, and they're trying to soothe that. And you're supposed to nurture your own body. And here are people, anorexic bulimia. It makes no sense to me. Your body is saying you need food, and your stubborn willfulness and rebellion says, I'm going to deprive my body of food. And I understand that the abuse and the control that you is almost, I've never met uh, anyone that struggled with anorexia that didn't have the abuse in and, and, and their life experience and, and their mindset of insecurity and the lack of control. And I'm very tender hearted with those people. And if that's you, you've had it in your past, you know, um, you could just say, well, just eat. You know, man, if it was that simple, their brain's broken. They need mental healing. And so we'll be getting into that this hour about what, what that healing looks like. But uh, it, it, it's really a very, very difficult thing. I want to believe true truth, and I want to submit myself to the will of God even when I don't like it because there's so many distractions. You know, pleasures are real distractions if you get right down to it. Things that pleasure me are a distraction because uh, I go after pleasure. You know, our motto in America is I want to I, I wanna be happy and, and feel good, and it's all about that. You know, you deserve a break today or you go for the gusto or whatever the commercial says. And uh, when I watch TV anymore, one of the foolish luxuries that I afford in our family is that we have this thing called DVR. You might know what that means. Uh, I don't watch live TV because I'd have to watch commercials. So I record everything and I watch it after. You know, if it's an hour program, about 20 minutes in, I can turn it on. I can just skip all the commercials. So I don't see all the commercials in advertising anymore. But they all want you to feel good. And sex sells. You know that. Just look at the commercials. They're, that's always selling. Uh, why? Pe- people like it. There's pleasure in erotic, uh, sensual pleasures in that for a moment. And that gratification, that arousal, we like. It feels good. So we get sucked into it. And that's why the commercials are so effective. And now we Christians, the, the minority uh, of people that are sold out Christians, Christian Christians, uh, the, and I'm, I'm presumptuous today, I'm presuming that you and I are here because we're Christian Christians, the ones that didn't come to, no, you dare judge them, but the ones that didn't show up today, they, they're, they're the not Christian Christians, but we're the Christian Christians, so pride comes before the fall, so I'm getting ready for a trip because I feel all 
puffed up right at the moment. We're the Christian Christians, and we're going to do it our way. And so as we try to do it the, the Christian Christian way, we're getting ready for all this. And uh, um, as we struggle to do that, we, we wind up in trouble uh, with wanting to satisfy ourselves for the pleasure of the moment. And uh, there's always consequences because there is pleasure in sin for a season. But we never, it just feels good. What's wrong with that? And so I, I step on all the, I, I try to hit as much idolatry during the weekend as I can because I don't want, I want to worship creator God. I don't want to worship creation. You know Romans 1, I expect. He's probably taught through that a few times. And, but uh, I, I don't want to worship creation. I want to worship creator of creation. I want to be overwhelmed with creation, but I want to worship. No idolatry. The creator God is the one I'm after in my worship and attention. So that's a big deal. And so how can I better focus on God, God this year than all the distractions of the world this year? Uh, what, what am I into for the rest of 2018? What am I going to do in 2019 as I think about my growth plan? God, what would you have me do to get better harvest out of the garden as we sow that? And so we're looking at that, and I always want to know, well, lies am I believing? What's the fake news? So th all that's to say, that's our introduction about what is change. Now, types of change. Um, you probably heard this expression, if you sow a seed, if, I'm sorry, if you sow a thought, you'll reap an action. As a man thinketh, so he does. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action enough times, you're going to reap a habit. It's kind of like devotions. If you do it often, all of a sudden it's not a chore anymore. It's just a routine. Now, in that routine, there should be change and blessing. But uh, So if you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a character. Boy, that's something you don't hear a whole lot of. If you sow a character... You reap a destiny. Where do you want to wind up? What's your destiny? In your growth in Christ. So if that's the truth and that's really what I'm doing, then I have to go back to what am I thinking? And uh, a couple of years ago, one of the things in my files that I got out is, what's my thought life like? What about the, the Bible talks about the mind of Christ? That expression or something related to that is in Scripture 92 times. Because in the secular world, and I've been exposed, I used to teach psychology uh, at the Bible college. I teach uh, secular psychology because I don't want to be stupid and naive to the tricks of the world. So I want to understand psychology, the study of the soul. Do they have any truth there? And they have some truth there. Do they have any perversions? Yeah, they got plenty of perversions. And then they have the different modalities. And we consider ourselves to be Christian counselors. And we can fit it our pigeonhole by any label that we want. But one of the labels is cognitive therapy. What's cognitive therapy? Oh, that's thought therapy. And so you have talk therapy using cognitive therapy. So I figure, well, I wonder what the Bible says about cognitive therapy. I wonder what it says about the mind of Christ. And remember yesterday, we talked about trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and trouble. So that's expected. When those things happen to me, when I get challenged with that, and I know that God always makes a way to escape, and all of us get tempted similarly, um, there's, a, there's some things about God in his word gives instruction concerning our mind, our thought life. And so there, there's tons of it. We're supposed to be of one mind. We Christians are supposed to be of one mind. Multiple times he says that. Um, out of the 92 times, and it says we're to be um, of one mind, like-minded. Uh, then it says in Acts 20, it says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Uh, Colossians 3.12 says, humbleness of mind, meekness. Um, Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. There's a whole bunch about the mind uh, of brothers and sisters, of like-mindedness in the cause of Christ. Being like-minded that way. So we should have common ground. If we don't have common ground, what, what's wrong here? It's either you or it's me. And I'm willing to look in the mirror and say, do we have common ground or is Steve in error? Uh, because Lord knows, uh, I mean, it, I don't want to be ashamed of my errors, you know, and, and shrink back in, in humiliation. I don't mind. I'd rather humble myself than be humiliated. So if I'm off somewhere, I expect to be told, hey, no, hey, Doc, you're off. Really? Tell me about it. Most of us, I'm not, I'm not saying, most of them would someone say, hey, you're off. Say, I am not. I study the word of God. I have devotions every day, blah, 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 blah. So, whoa, whoa, 
Humility of mind says, all right, help me understand where I'm off. And uh, I want to be open-minded and say, if you've got true truth, please help me. And that's the great thing about having a bunch of Christians. And there's freedom in Christ. And our counselors love the freedom we have in Christ. And the freedom to say, hey, you know, I'm not sure that's, that's not what I've understood. Am I wrong or are you wrong? Let's, let's find the mind of Christ and be okay. Because we're on the same team. Uh, we wear the same jersey. We all have our own number. But God, we're all for Christ, I think. And if you're not yet, by the time you leave today, I hope, I hope we're back on the same team. We're all for Christ. Um, not only does it says that we have God give instruction to the mind, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Along with that, God tells us we're going to have mind problems. There's going to be problems with the mind. He kind of puts it this way. And seek ye not what ye shall eat or drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. Um, I have to believe that if not everybody, almost everybody here has felt that insecurity, we just doubt. And uh, I know theology. I studied, I love studying theology. Years ago when I was in seminary, I loved theology courses. But every once in a while, I was like, hey, God, is this, is this really real? You know, is, I, did, did Jesus, was he really incarnate? Did he live a perfect life? Did he really die on the cross for me? I mean, how'd you come up with that plan? Did you ever just... Every once in a while. Now, I don't mind having doubts. As long as after the doubts, I come to the right conclusion. You can doubt God. God, are you for real? And God, one way or another, can definitely get his message across. Stephen, I'm for real. That's the truth. Then I can find relief. So I don't mind insecurity. I mind if I'm dwelling in it indefinitely, and it becomes a theme of my life. But... Brother and sister in Christ, I promise you, it, with all my being, I know this is true truth. It just is. And I don't want to live in doubtful mind. Worse than that, in Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 28, it talks about, and even they did not, uh, you know, Romans, the end of chapter 1 of Romans, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate or backward thinking mind to do those things which are not convenient or natural. So some people get a backward thing in mind. They think what's wrong is right, and they think what's right is wrong. That's terrifying to me. For their good, I'm okay. I'm secure in Christ. We talked about security in Christ last night. I'm secure. Hey, my rewards are waiting for me. The room's made. The bed's made. Didn't have to wait for a maid. It's all ready for me today. I have total confidence in that. But some people, my heart goes out to them. And when I'm talking to someone that will deny, I have a couple of atheists on my client thing. They're, they're devoted atheists. And when they find out that I'm a Christian, they, they wonder, can I still get therapy and counseling from this guy that says he's born-again Christian? Is he going to hurt me, help me? Should I be disgusted with him? They have all these questions about me. And I welcome them. I have no problem. They're, they're lost. And someone that leaves the, the therapeutic environment and goes on in life without Christ, my, my heart goes out. And I said, God, is he one of the ones? Is she one of the ones? that are going to spend eternity in hell. Because my hope is, everybody I talk to, I'm sowing seeds. If they don't come to Christ during counseling and that I've sown enough seed that someone else will reap the harvest, and I'm absolutely okay with that. But every once in a while, you find someone that's absolutely saying, no, no, no. And I, I can't, I, by the wisdom of God, I decide whether or not I should tell them, you're on your way to hell. There's no hope. Your only hope is redemption through Christ, the cross, something. And so it's terrifying that there are people that are locked into there is no God. That takes more faith than realizing there's a creator. And uh, I like the ones that say, I don't know God, but I know there has to be God because I don't know where the Big Bang came from. Well, I'm not sure there was a Big Bang. I think God just spoke it and it happened. But you can believe it's a Big Bang. Maybe it was. I know things are moving. But he can. Adam was created mature. Our, our existence, our, our solar systems and galaxies, they could have been created good. He, he didn't need a belly button. You know that story. Uh, but some people just think about that. And so now here's someone that have a backward thinking mind, a reprobate mind, and, and all those things that are natural become unnatural to them. And, you know, was I born this way? We'll get to nature and nurture in a couple of minutes. But um, uh, Colossians 1, uh, 21 says, and you were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet know not how to be reconciled. Some people don't know how to fix what's broke. That was Colossians 1, 21. 
And uh, then in Ephesians uh, 4, verse 17, it talks about the vanity of their mind. And uh, uh, then Romans 8, 7 talks about a carnal mind. So many, so many different things. So when we talk about cognitive therapy in the mind, God gives instructions to the, instructions to the mind. It's being led of the Spirit, we should have the mind of Christ and be like-minded of the same mind. But God warns there are brain problems, there's mind problems uh, th that go on. And then thirdly, about the mind, the potential of the mind. It's pretty good. We have the mind of Christ. Do you ever think that we can think God thoughts? Like God's given us an ability. I mean, dog, you may love dogs and cats, I don't know, or, or, or you know, maybe you have lizards or some other kind of pet or horses or cows, whatever you got, uh, but they don't have the mind of Christ. You are special. God decided in his creation, made in the image of God, he's given us the mind of Christ. We can think Christ thoughts. I think that's pretty amazing. It tells us that uh, we should have a ready mind. Several different times we should, and um, for there be first a willing mind. And that's a big deal because then it's an act of your will. You can have a willing mind in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12. Um, you can have a fervent mind. You can have a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, uh, and we should be fully persuaded in our own mind. We should have that confidence. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, Jesus uh, writes to us through uh, Peter, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You know what that means. He tied up the road so we, rope so we could run. To, do you ever stop and think, because this is what I, I've done all week long or weeks long. It's like I'm preparing my mind. Can, can I be rightly focused on the material? Because th there's more than I could cover in a week. And you know, wh Which of this about suffering, you know, what kind of therapy do you want me to talk about? But uh, God says a lot about cognitive therapy and then behavioral therapy. You know, do the right thing. You know, we'll talk about that when we talk about alcohol in a couple of minutes. But uh, what I'm really thankful for, uh, or before I get to that, the ugly part of that, in Romans 7 talks about when Paul's saying there's a warring going on in his mind. And he follows up in Romans 12, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. You could probably quote this for me. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. So I got, I got, I got to renew my mind. I got, I got to think the right thoughts because I've been polluted with the wrong thoughts. Uh, recently, I talked to a, a young lady who's uh, married to a lost guy, and uh, she was at Bible college. Went away to Bible college, and he missed her and wanted her and loved her. And please come home, be with me. I need you. I need you. And so he persuaded her. And now that, and she came home, and she did get married to him. And now she's understanding that where she compromised. And she's repentant and she's heartbroken that, you know, she disobeyed God and it may have ruined her life. And uh, there's a lot of compassion. I don't want to minimize any of that. But uh, she's trying to share prayer now is God, renew my mind. I, I want to know true truth. And regardless of the consequences, I now don't want to try and make up for my messed up. I just want to do the right thing, sow the right seed. And God, I'll let you take care of the results because she's a child, she's a daughter of God. She's God's kid. And I don't know about how you love your kids, but I can't even begin to appreciate how God loves his kids. It's a really big deal. And I remember, tried to do everything I could to remind her, you're a daughter of the king. He adores you. You're a princess. You're the king's daughter. Live that way. Let God take care of the rest. And we need to renew it. Excuse me, a renewing our mind. We need a transformed mind. So when we talk about cognitive therapy, there's several different things that are going on here that we need to be mindful of and, and say, okay, God, you be God, I'll, I'll be your child, and I'm just going to obey what, my, what Dad says to me. So uh, these are the types of changes that we're looking for concerning the mind. I want to talk a little bit about addiction now under the subject of types of change. Um, there, there's a whole lot new going on. And when I, when I came into uh, counseling back in the uh, 70s and early 80s, when I'm starting to read uh, Jay Adams, we were talking about a little bit earlier, competent to counsel. And I'm st um, that was long before they had MRI technology. I don't know if you know him or somewhere I have the guy's name uh, who came up with the, the MRI technology, gave a credit. He's a born-again Christian. He's a creationist. And you know how they say creationists can never have any intelligence, but the designer of the MRI technology was a is a born-again Christian. And uh, um, it's just great to, to realize that some Christians can have brains too. Imagine that, God giving us some technology. And so that, that's a wonderful thing. But uh, in, the, in the process of that, um, I used to think that ADD was poor parenting. And I'm a parent. If I had an AD kid, I used to think that it was just poor parenting. 
And I did a lot of counseling. I did some damage early on. And once MRI technology came out, uh, I'll have you have a little brochure here. I don't have too many left, and I can't get them anymore for some reason. But Dr. Daniel Amen, he has a, that SPECT imaging brains. If you open it up, you can see where brain damage happens. It even has pictures of an ADD brain. So I'll, I'll let you pass it around and see what happens when we damage actually the neurons, the transmitters. I ask people, so where's the soul of man? And they say, if you know anything about neurons, uh, is it in the neurons? You know, is it in there somewhere? And, and one supposedly scientific per colleague of mine said, no, it's in the synaptic cleft, that little space between where all the neurotransmitters go firing back and forth. They're convinced the soul's in that space somewhere. I said, can you see it? No, <laughs> They're not saying they see it, but uh, I'll let you pass it around. I am convinced that uh, ADD is not poor parenting. Uh, we can see now that we can look. Because understand, up until the mid-80s and into the 90s, we, we could not see what was going on in the brain. We saw what the brain was doing, but we could not see the brain itself. A heart, you can see a part of the heart's not working. You know, a broken bone, you can see the bones that's broken. But we could never see the brain until recent. And uh, when I was uh, first getting exposed to neurotransmitters and understanding some of the different dopamines and serotonins, and we're not getting into that today. I can't do it well. I, I've studied it. It's beyond my expertise, so I, I know it. But what I have learned for sure is that when, that when parts of the brain are not operating, it affects the way we think, the way we live, the way we do. And so uh, if, you had, uh, if you get in a car accident and your head hits the steering wheel because the airbag didn't want to go off and you have traumatic brain injury... We can guarantee certain, uh, uh, within the next year, uh, people with TBI, traumatic brain injury, they will go a season of depression, and medicine doesn't fix, fix that. Heart attacks, um, there's, there's things that we can't fix. They're going to go through a season, a body, our physical body, our neurons make adjustments to this. So um, now there is poor parenting, there is, and there's also malfunctioning brain cells. And so we have found out certain medications do certain things. And ADD has to do with poor blood circulation in the front lobe of the brain. And uh, if we fix the, front, the, the circulation of food and oxygen to the front lobe of the brain, all of a sudden the child can now sit still in his chair. But without the medication, that increases the blood flow and the uh, food and oxygen to the front of the brain. They, they can't. They're out of control. They, are, they cannot control that. You can't make them sit still. They'll, they'll explode, they'll rebel, they'll do that. So now, is there an appropriate use of medication? Yes, there is. You know, if I have a headache, I'm not going to be dumb. I may take some Excedrin. Well, well, there's something going on. Now the headache goes down. Okay, so there is some actual stuff. Now, I'm not pro-medication. I'm not pro-medication. But I'm not so anti-medication. But I certainly want to do spiritual transformation first. I want to make sure that we're right with God because we know if Nebuchadnezzar can go insane for seven years and it's had nothing to do, in my understanding of Scripture, they had nothing to do with medication. He didn't get go to a psychiatrist and get some meds and get his sanity back. No, he went nuts and ate grass in the field. He went loco because it was a spiritual issue. Now, it takes insight and experience, and I'm very reluctant to pass judgment on anybody. And uh, when they come in, if they're loaded up with uh, medications... Um, I'm not going to say stop your medication because that can cause convulsions and other things. You don't want to do that either. So there's a balance. So if I'm going to grow, and my plan is to grow this year, in what way should I grow? I want to grow in knowledge. Proverbs talks about knowledge. It also talks about progressive. Like how do I want to change? Where is it going to change going to come from? Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom is all in the book of Proverbs. There's a progression of thought. I want to grow in knowledge. I want new data. So I want... To grow in information, data, knowledge, understanding. I have to accurately interpret the knowledge that I'm given. Because you and I can look at the same thing, or you and a heathen and I can look at the same thing. We can give glory to the God, and they're saying it's just, you know, nature. And uh, no, it's not nature, it's God. But they don't know that, so there's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom is what I really focus on with our counselors. I want you to whiz, apply your understanding and skillfully, skillfully, Work your craft that God's entrusted to you, your ministry. I want you to skillfully take the information that he's entrusted to us and, and work with these people. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Now beyond that, there's another threesome trilogy kind of in Proverbs that God gave to me. Um, he gave it to you too. I, I, you probably stumbled on it, but I stumbled on it. And it's called insight, where I can see. It's not data. It's seeing into stuff 
God gives insight. He reveals stuff to counselors. He reveals stuff to the clients. The clients can have this awakening moment and say, oh, guess what I just figured? I don't know. Wow. They get insights into their own lives. Talk therapy helps people think out loud. And people that are silent and, th- and think quietly, it's different when they talk out loud and they, and they start telling me stuff and the light bulbs go on. Thank you, Lord. Uh, like they share stuff with me and their light bulb goes on. Uh, and it's, thank you so much. I didn't do anything. You've done a lot of listening and, and, that's, and you, I learned this from your listening. Like, I, God, I don't get you. Uh, but it's reality. It really is reality. And so knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, insight, discernment. What do I need to do? Do I need a scalpel? Insight, discernment, and discretion. When do we do surgery? When do we do it? What do we do? I want to see into the problem. What do we do, and when should we do it? Because there is a point in time where people aren't ready. When I came to Christ, I, I got a job in September, and immediately one of my coworkers, uh, I was in my 20s, he was in his 50s, uh, his name's Dick, he's one of my disciples, Dick and Helen, Dick told Helen about it, Helen's idea is, well, we should get on our knees every morning and pray for Stephen. And uh, they had a son, Stephen, that was born again, but on, on the mission field in Switzerland, so they kind of spiritually adopted me as their new son. But they got on my knees in September and started praying for me. And I didn't come to Christ till July, July 16th, 1978. Folks, I got to tell you something. I'm an answer to prayer. People prayed for me. And I was obnoxious. I was not, I was in the world right out of secular college. And, you know, I joined a fraternity. You know all these things they say, uh, you know, that goes on in fraternities. And all the fraternity members say, oh, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. I got bad news for you. Everything we were accused of that we said didn't happen, we were bold-faced liars, it all went on. It all went on. So I'm right out of college, and I'm getting this job, and it was a good job, really good job. God gave me that job, the best job I know I've ever had coming out of all my classmates. Uh, there was one student that got a better job working for one of the oil companies. Otherwise, I got the best starting salary out of everybody I knew. It's like, God, why are you doing this to me? I flunked my way through college. I didn't study. I was too busy partying. It was terrible. Not a good thing. And God blessed in spite of me, gave me this job, and Dick and Helen prayed from September. And when I came to Christ in July, I became an answer to their prayers. What a thing. Now, I was involved in all that other stuff. And God had to give me a a transforming experience. So when I look at Proverbs and what does good growth look like for my counselors, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, are they learning more? I want them to go to the workshops. Do they understand what that means in light of Scripture? Scripture's our filter. Wisdom, can they live skillfully in in light of that? And then you have insight. Are you seeing new things? And I love when the breakthrough moments, oh, I never saw this before. And uh, some of the older counselors have been around the block for 20 years say, yeah, yeah, I remember when I learned that. It's wonderful. It goes on. And then, then discretion, what do I do? Discernment, when do I do it? And, and it's a wonderful thing. That's good growth in, in our skillful. God gives skill. And the neat things about the, the wisest men in all the nation of Israel during the time of the tabernacle and the temple, God gives honor to the craftsmen. He says those, the men that built the tabernacle were the wisest men in all of Israel. They knew how to do their skills. So I don't know what your skills are. You have them. We've all been gifted. We all have gifts, spiritual gifts. We all have gifts. You're, you're gifted. Are you enjoying the growth in your gift? You know, if, if it's clean in the nursery, are you enjoying Are you learning new things about now we got all these flus and come along? And these, are you learning how to care for the nursery, for the children that are going to be led to Christ and in your nursery? If you're in a Sunday school class with the pulpit, are, are, you know, I'm trusting Pastor Kevin's growing. I hope his preaching is going to be gooder next year than it is this year because he's growing. I want him to go to some workshops, seminars, borrow brains. You know, there's nothing new. We're talking about how we find messages and stuff and how God inspires us. And, and the Holy Spirit works through us and regardless. And uh, it's all good. So that's good growth. So we have cognitive therapy and then we have addictions. Um, uh, it's not, I don't think it's in your notes. I think it's, let me double check and see what's in there. No, it's not. Under types of change. Good. Um, when it comes to addiction, they say that addiction is a disease. So if you have addiction, what makes a disease a disease? Is addiction uh, a bacteria? No. Is it a virus? No. Is it a fungus? No. But they say it's a disease. So what does it mean by disease? 
Now I want you and I, how do I tolerate this secular field and, and not be offensive? Uh, the AMA, back, back in 1959, realized that alcoholism was big business. Now they can say what they want. If you're a doctor or a therapist or a counselor in here, I don't mean to be offensive, but, but the, the, it's published in books. And they, made, they redefined the idea of the word disease. Disease is not a disease anymore. Disease is something else. What is a disease? Is it a germ? Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? What, what, what's a disease? A disease. So the AMA came up with this definition. And uh, the definition is that when we have this, this thing, I'll call it a thing for the moment, um, when you have a disease, there is a known cause. Now, if it's cancer, there's cancer cells that are eating up other parts of the body. If it's alcohol, they know what the problem is. It's called alcohol. And so alcohol destroys livers, blah, 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 blah. You know, so we know what alcohol kills neurons. We know what alcohol does. So, well, we know there's a known cause. Number two is that there is a progression of symptoms. You don't treat cancer, it keeps going. You don't treat alcoholism, it keeps going. So the second piece of alcoholism in a disease model, alcohol is a disease, and the commercials that we see in TV in our neighborhood, I assume they're the same, you know, they're suffering from a disease of addiction. You know, and now with the heroin, well, heroin is really bad, and now heroin isn't the bad thing. Now it's fentanyl because it's a thousand times stronger, and fentanyl is killing people. One of our counselors had a son that was in a safe house in Florida, had been through detox, had been through um, months of uh, inpatient. Uh, they're now an outpatient, and they're living in a safe house, and uh, they had a relapse. He had had three other relapses. I believe it was his fourth relapse. And this time he got heroin after being clean six months. If you know anything, when you're using heroin, you need more and more bags. You know, it's up to a 10-bag-a-day habit is common. I got a call for someone who has a 10-bag-a-day habit right now, and they're, they're, they want to get them in hopefully Monday if it works that way. And so they may come in if they don't kill themselves over the weekend. They said they were going to go, I guess it's Saturday today. They were going to go Saturday. They're going to go to uh, detox to get off the heroin. And so what... Uh, what the danger is at that point, if he gets clean for six months like uh, Michael did, um, then he relapsed and started heroin again. Uh, someone else in a safe house brought the heroin into the safe house, uh, but the heroin wasn't pure heroin. It also had fentanyl in it. And his tolerance had gotten way down like he had never been a drug addict. And one use, he died, and with his door locked, um, he used on Sunday night, and they didn't find him till Monday night. And so by the time they found him, there was no resuscitation. There was no kit to try and get him back breathing again. And so Gail, our therapist, it, it rocked her world. And uh, this is several years back now. And uh, she stopped counseling. She was ripped to shreds. Because uh, I had known the whole story of how, how Michael got involved with that. And this, the back story, which got him into drugs and alcohol, um, he, he was a big guy, strong, well fit, and he was one of the better athletes in his high school. He was a starter on the football team and the basketball team, a uh, very capable, decent student, outstanding athlete. And uh, one day, the coach ripped on him, ripped on him really hard, and he felt humiliated in front of the team, so he quit basketball. He quit basketball. He was, he was a starter. He was an excellent athlete. But the coach, unknowingly, made an example out of him. And he was a tender-hearted kid, and he, so he quit the team. And mom said, what do you mean you're not going to practice? I quit. What do you mean you quit? You can't quit. And he, he stuffed it, and he didn't have what it took to share the, the humiliation. Uh, and I talked to Gail afterwards. I said, we, let's go to the – I'll go with you. Let's go to the director of athletics. So let, let's go to the principal. Let's, let's go to the guidance. School. Let's do something. But he started drinking and drugging and spiraling down. And got into rehab three different times, went through detox, inpatient, outpatient. And this time, with no tolerance left because he'd been clean for six months, took heroin, which might have killed him by itself, but it had fentanyl in it. And he died, and he wasn't found for a day later. So Gail said, you know, she's determined. She's a mom. She started walking the streets to, of Camden nearby us and finding anybody that was, looked like they were using drugs and tried to talk to them and get them off drugs. She went to the street evangelism against heroin. She was born again Christian. She shared the love of God and told them to get off the drugs. And she was frustrated. And one of the other things that she did just within the last six months is she opened up a safe house that she's determined this is, place is going to be safe. So, and so now we have a, a, a nonprofit at, for Michael and uh, it's a great thing, but uh, we have to understand, we, we know the cause, 
number one. Number two is we know the progression of symptoms. And number three, we know that left untreated, uh, we know the outcome. Number three is we know the outcome. So addiction by the American Medical Association, if they define it as a medical issue, now they control the purse. They control the finances. So they can have inpatients. They can have uh, detoxes. And instead of trusting it to, and the best, you know something about AA, the AA people, the sponsors of AAP are alcoholics. They didn't go to college. They don't have an MD. They don't have a DO. Um, they don't own hospitals. They're just people on the street that are discipling others. Oh, their, their discipleship isn't towards Christianity. Their discipleship, their, their motto is, if, if you're, you're here and you know, it's just not drink today. Basically, that's what they're saying. They want to die without having another drink. That's their, their goal is, my, I'm a successful member of AA if I die without having another drink. Well, that's okay for AA, but that's not okay for me. That's not what I want my alcoholics to do. Because if you understand the 12 steps, there's a part in that 12 steps where you say, there's a spiritual awakening. There's, and I say, so I get to that. What step are you working on? Well, my sponsor has me working on the first three steps, which talks about surrender and other things. And I say, okay, now, and I urge them, get a sponsor that's going to get you through the 12 steps. So, well, that's, that Bill W. guy, his, his dad was a, a, a member of the Oxford group. Uh, it was a Christian organization. That's why the 12 steps is so, such in, such, in such harmony with Scripture. And so he's, they're, they're saying, let's get through the steps. Uh, and step you know, one talks about powerlessness over alcohol. And when we come to Christ, we're powerlessness. We need Christ. And so there's a lot of similarity. You get up to the later steps where you take a, a, a moral inventory, and which really to me is what 1 John 1, 9 says, is we confess our sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us. So then it comes to a spiritual awakening. So I said, what step are you working on? Are you up to a spiritual awakening yet? No. Well, you need to get there. Because once they get there in 12 steps, now we can say, what's, who, who's your higher power? Who's, let's talk about the higher power. And AA can be the bridge God uses in many situations. I'm not pro 12 steps. Uh, I didn't get saved even when I was drinking and drugging and running around. 12 steps didn't help me. Church helped me. I'd rather see them in church, but if, they're not gonna, if I can't get them in church, I'm going to learn how to use. Remember I said insight, discernment, discretion? I want to see into what's going on in their life that I can use the tools that are in their life to build a bridge so they can come to Christ. That's addiction. And uh, it, addiction's ugly. And a lot of immorality goes with addiction. But if that's the ministry, you know, I, I'm a good Samaritan. You saw this guy in a mess li- along the road. Man, you're a mess. Uh, ministry isn't clean. It's holy. But they can be a mess, and we need to love on them. Remember I said love your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? The guy on the road. The guy downtown, the part of town you don't go to. Now I'm saying go there midnight on a Friday or Saturday night. I'm not telling you to be stupid. Be, be discerning. But there's a right time to reach out with the love of Christ. And if you don't see quick results, and it reminds me of what we talked about last night. Do you need quick results? I'm past quick results. Charity or love is long suffering. So it's a long time. Am I, am I willing to go a long time? What's the rush? I'm here until God takes me home. I don't care how long it takes. If I get the idea that I'm called of God to minister to this person, I'm going to hang with him. God didn't tell me he'd get saved this week or next week. He didn't say he'd even come to church. I'm just going to love. And we're going to understand addiction. And addiction is knowing the cause, knowing what's going to happen on the course of action, know the conclusion. They're going to die. Now, I like the C's because the fourth C that isn't in the AMA, but Steve likes to add, is I know the cure. We know the cause. We know the course of of destruction. And uh, we know the conclusion. Uh, We also, in Christ, we know the cure. And when they say they have a disease, I ask them, is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? I want the addict to understand when they say a disease, the disease model talks about we know the cause, we know what happens to you during the course of abuse, and we know the conclusion, you die unless you do the cure. What's the cure? Don't drink. Now that sounds real easy. And when they go into detox and they're in a padded room, and they're, and they're reeking. You know, it's, it's the worst recovery they ever, they ever did it. And, and uh, the, the, especially heroin's real popular today. And, and they go through withdrawal. And they wish they would die. But heroin withdrawal does not kill. They wish they could die. It does not, heroin withdrawal never kills. Alcohol withdrawal does kill. 
If you're a heavy drinker, if you're drinking a fifth a day and you go cold turkey, alcohol withdrawal can kill your body will shut down. Heroin will never cause the body to shut down. Using heroin can cause the body to it'll suppress your breathing and stuff and you can die that way. But during the course of withdrawal, you never die from that. Now, so now they come up with methadone clinics. In a methadone clinic, you're still addicted. You're still in bondage to your sin. There's not freedom in Christ when you're in a methadone clinic. Now they have this new super cure, um, Suboxone. Um, now, I, I work with uh, addicts, heroin addicts, and they get off the, the heroin and they get away from the fentanyl and they get on Suboxone, which is a really, really big money maker for the doctors and the pharmacists. It is, it is big bucks, more than you and I can appreciate. It's, it's a rich... If you get a license to distribute Suboxone, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of money, and money's polluting the brain. So if you're doing the Suboxone thing, and the Suboxone thing goes on, I've worked with them, and they can start off with you know, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, whatever it's doing, and then they'll try and wean off. Uh, I, would, I beg with a new, got new person in recovery that if you're going to go on to Suboxone, and you're not already abusing Suboxone, but you're going on for the first time, you, you go to a doctor that will make sure within three or four months you're off the Suboxone before the body adjusts to the Suboxone. Because I've had a couple of different clients where they're on Suboxone, they're going to, they're going to withdraw themselves. So tell me how you're doing. Well, I'm going to go from 40 to 20 to 10 to 5 to, and they get down to a quarter of a tablet. And they're, they're convinced they got it until they get to that quarter of a tablet. And then they try stopping it. And their body revolts. And I've heard from the two that I've worked with and tales of others that withdrawal from Suboxone is worse than withdrawal from heroin. And they think they can do it. They usually make two or three attempts. And then they, oh, I relapsed. I couldn't stop the craving, so I went back on. I did it by myself. My mom was there with me. She helped me. I couldn't do it, so I went back on. So both of those cases, they went back out on the streets on heroin. And then they went through heroin withdrawal, which was way easier than Suboxone withdrawal. So you're nuts. You're going to go back on. Yeah, what if you get fentanyl? It's a risk I have to take because I can't beat Suboxone on myself, and I don't want to be addicted for life. They don't want to be addicted for life. So they go back onto something different. So it's a big deal. Um, what makes that? Now, I talked about that's supposed to be, uh, that should be the disease model. My bad. I, well, it changes to disease. What did I do with my mar black market? There it is. That's disease. Okay, disease. Addiction. What makes an addiction an addiction? Addiction makes an addiction when there's two components. Number one of three. Number one is addiction is compulsion of behavior and obsession of mind. It's a two-component thing. In the addiction stuff, what makes it? You obsess of mind. We talked about cognitive therapy, the mind of Christ. Obsession of mind and compulsive behavior. Now, we say they can't stop, but they can on their own. It's when you look through that picture that's going around, when their brain is damaged, they have neuro highways where their thought process go through their brain and they are out of control. They can't stop themselves from thinking. It's like you're going to sneeze and we say, don't sneeze. You blow your eardrums out, but you're going to sneeze. Don't sneeze. It's, it's that kind of automatic behavior. Now, I'm not condoning it. I'm trying to understand it. If they're thinking about it, they can't stop thinking. It's kind of like when I say, think about the color green. Oh, don't think about green. What color are you thinking about? Now, some people say, oh, purple. But for the most of us, say green. Green, I'm thinking about green. They can't stop thinking about green. They wake up in the morning, they're thinking green. They go to work, they're thinking green. They're at work all day, they're thinking green. Uh, like cigarette smokers say, well, uh, I'd be surprised if there weren't some cigarette smokers here. And it's like, uh, just stop smoking. <laughs> you don't get it. The, the cravings drive me nuts. I can't function if I don't. Well, get a patch. Now, there is cure for every addiction, including cigarettes and alcohol and drugs and gambling. There, there are cures available. It's hard work. I mean, it took a hard work to, for you to get messed up. It's going to be hard for you to fix it. But it's doable, especially for those of us that have Christ. And uh, I don't know why God's blessed me so kindly, but when I uh, stopped drinking and drugging and running around um, at that time, he delivered me. I guess I'm too weak. He knew I couldn't handle the cravings. So the people say, 
I, I just I was in church every single day, and all I did was think church. I'd never seen a Bible before. It took me two months, the first two months of my life, I read through uh, the whole New Testament. And uh, I didn't know that it was different than the Old Testament. Uh, I just thought it was reworked. Moses did something different in the New Testament than he did in the Old Testament. I mean, I, I was clueless. Uh, but I, I just uh, surrendered myself to Christianity as best I knew how, and it wasn't all good, but it was mostly good. And uh, so there is deliverance for me and for you and, and for those that are in the disease uh, of addiction. Uh, there's doable. So obsession of mind, compulsive behavior. And uh, number two, which leads us uh, on the addiction thing, is to loss of control. I can't control it. Number three is, um, so number two is loss of control. And number three is we know those that are in addiction, they know about the adverse uh, consequences. They know that it can kill them. They know it. And they'd rather die high than live life clean. It, the, the disease, the, the, al- the alcohol, the drugs has convinced them you want to live with this pleasure. If you're going to live, that's the way you want to live. So um, that's a big deal. Now, I've talked about addiction, several different things, and I'm willing to entertain a question or two if you have uh, before I go on about addiction. We're going to talk about depression next. All right, now I don't see any hands waved. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a break. Let me get through a, a little bit about uh, um, uh, whatever I was going to say, uh, depression. Uh, depression is very real, and I wanted to think about all the different possibilities. Where does depression come from? Um, there is, just like ADD, and when you're looking at there is a neurological component, and the question is what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, was I addicted uh, or was I depressed before this, or did this cause depression? Uh, the this is things can be. Uh, can be trauma. The people that are losing everything in these floods, uh, they are very depressed, and uh, some of them are sensitive people. Oh, let me talk about sensitivity. I was told I was too sensitive. I don't think I said this this weekend yet. I was told growing up I was too sensitive. I was a mommy's boy. I'm so sorry, uh, um, but it is what it is, and, and so I was a mommy's boy, and I was, I was tender-hearted, so I would cry easily. I still cry easily, and people would say, stop your crying before I give you something to cry about, or, uh, you know, why are you such a big baby, and all that stuff, and uh, it took, uh, in my 30s, when all of a sudden God revealed to me, um, uh, sensitivity is a gift. Sensitive people cry easy. They hurt real big. I can't watch a Hallmark movie without crying. Uh, sorry, yeah, and my wife said, are you going to cry again? Is it Hallmark? It's a given. It's a given. Steve, you know, are you a big crybaby? And uh, I, I hurt. I, I ache. My heart aches. It's, I'm sentimentalist. It, guilty is charged. Um, it's a gift because although it hurts huge, I hurt bad when I hurt. I hurt really bad when I'm hurting. But those of us that hurt really bad and they tell us to just get over it, we're the best lover, lover God has. We love big. Can't you love that person? I like them. Now, they would never say it that way. But us sensitive people, we hurt bad, not bad. There's a third to a half of us that are, that are big, big hurting people, and we're also big lovers. And we out love those people that are blunt in their affect. You know, they're not just not that sensitive. You know, some people get stung by a bee. It's no big deal. Others go into shock. You know, we go into shock. We come out of it. But we love huge. We make lots of honey. And uh, so that's big. Now, depressed people, not all people will get depression, but some will when they suffer losses. Depression comes from losses. It can come from trauma. Um, it can come from a death of a, of a loved one. And the closer the loved one, the more difficult it is. Um, uh, it, it can come from uh, um, terrorists, I think is another thing. Uh, if you're scared, you know, that can traumatize you. Military people, about a third of the military people that come back from war in the, in the Middle East right now, about a third of them are suffering from PTSD. Um, and not all of them. And I, I would suggest, and I'm, I, I love our military, and if you're a military, I really, really appreciate what you do for our country. But as a clinician, as someone that's trying to care for military, the people that suffer from PTSD, they had a different personality type. If they did a personality analysis thoroughly, They would say, you can serve the army, but you're not going to infantry. I mean, you can work on this. You know, you can be a mechanic, but you you can't go to the front lines. Your personality isn't designed for that. You do something else. You're a techie. Do a techie thing. Do something else. But about a third that are coming off those front lines, those those guys and gals don't belong there. And they're suffering with PTSD. So what's PTSD? Uh, PTSD, in in a psychological framework, um, the treatment's something different. um, There's several different modalities that are being effective. Um, but what's happening there, true story, uh, one of my first experiences, um, guys out there, and they're, they're in their base, and all of a sudden they, they hear artillery going off, 
and he and his friend go out the tent to get ready in position where they belong, and he is his best friend, and they, were, they joined together, they lived together, they bedded together, they wore together, and the two of them go out, and as sure as he's standing there, they both get out of the tent, and uh, uh, I think they were eating a meal, and, and uh, something came by, and all of a sudden, his friend's on the ground, and his head was not there. So um, one of the most traumatic stories I have, so what do you do with that? You don't do anything with that. You go to your post. And you're a war machine, you do war now. And so you don't have the ability to process the loss of your best friend whom you love. You have no time to think you're a, a war machine, go do your war machine stuff. But then they come back and it haunts them again and again and again. So what has to happen is that their emotional reality, if they weren't in war and they saw a tragedy, then they get to cry, come back, no, I'm so sorry, it was my fault. Because then they have survivor's guilt and everything else. And you don't have a chance to process, we talked about the process, they don't have a chance to process that, so treatment for PTSD is after the trauma's over, we have to reunite their emotions with their intellect of what truly happened. Now they have to have life adjustments. So it's, it is emotional, it is psychological, it's just the mind of Christ kind of stuff. And now we have to reorient life because he wanted to go home and tell his best friend's wife what happened. And years later, he can go and meet with her, but when they come back, you know, the, someone's already been there and told, by the way, your husband's gone. And... Uh, but to say all that would happen, um, to reunite the, the body, because there's a fracture in us when we're traumatized. So there's all different ways we can struggle with depression. Uh, it can be uh, physical, medical uh, from trauma. It can be psychological. It can be circumstantial. Um, all kinds of different ways that we have depression. And I don't jump quick to s say someone with depression, let's get on meds. What I want to do, if they get on meds, and sometimes if, they're, if they can't get out of bed in the morning and they're truly crippled by the, the heaviness of what happened, um, I'm not against medication to get them back because that will reduce some of their... The, the goal of medication, the way we use it, is it minimizes the effect of the trauma. It minimizes, so it's not quite as devastating. So... Um, then as, uh, as they go through that, um, they have less impact so they can begin to function. And the idea is never stay on those medications longer than necessary. If it's not a biological depression, uh, we've discerned it. This is not biology. It's circumstantial. It's life experience. Within the year, it's like when, how does life return to normal? If you lose a loved one the first year, Mother's Day, Father's Day, it's all different. Birthdays are different. Uh, holidays are different. The family reunion on Fourth of July is different. Everything's different. By the second year, you should be able to assimilate some change. And we talked about how do you know if they're healing? How do you know if they're growing? Well, there are three measurements. F how frequent do they think of this? Uh, when they think of it, how long does it last and how intense is it? And if you allow them to, to, to cry and sob a few times, it can be a few months. At the end of a few months, by the end of the first year, I want to measure, not at the end of the month, but at the end of the first year, um, how, how to go. The Jewish uh, community in, in past times has had a, a grieving process where the week of the death, everybody visits the family of the deceased. After the first week, for the next three weeks, the, at the end of the first month, they congregate every day at the, at the synagogue or at church. They come together and they grieve. They tell their stories at the end of the first month. And then they stop meeting. So for a week, it's every day they're in the f home of the deceased. And then they're every day at temple or synagogue for the, th the end of the first month. And then for the rest of the year, they'll come in the morning, but they don't have to congregate. And they'll have morning worship and services, kind of like the Catholics have mass. The Jews have minion when they come together and they read the Torah and all that stuff. But at the end of the first year, that's when they have the unveiling. That's when they uncover the stone of the deceased, and they have a ceremony. And then you're, then at the end of the first year, they say, from now on, it's got to be different. Life has been adjusted. Now we live without our mom or dad, whatever it is. And uh, um, then every year on Yom Kippur, they'll have a remembrance of those that have gone on before us. So they, they in their culture, they talked about grieving in at least three to four different stages. We don't prepare for that. We don't prepare for that. So what are we going to do different? And so we say, hey, first week, we just weep and wail. Then at the end of the month, then we start going to synagogue instead. Of, and then at the end of the year, we, we, the, like Christians seem to put their stone down. They get the memorial stone right away. You know, the Jews take their time. And at the end of the year, okay, we've made the adjustment. Now we live without. We don't allow ourselves to go through that kind of season. Most people don't know it. But am I considering? Because that uh, helps us go through it, uh, the whole idea of grieving and lossing and depression and sadness. And uh, as I kind of close up this idea of number two types of change, um, 
like what I said at the beginning, I didn't understand ADD. I used to thought it was poor parenting. I still have some questions that I ask myself in the growth journey. Because remember, I talked about growth. How do I change? How do I grow? I ask myself the question, what do I know? What true truth do I have? And what don't I know about yet? Because when I was judging parents for poor parenting, I, I, I really needed to apologize to them for judging them wrongly. Now, if God gives me insight, understanding, and discretion, it's a big deal. But I want to know what I know, but I want to know what I don't know. I don't, there's so many things I don't know about medicine, and now let's bring it to the spiritual. I, I believe I know what I know when it comes to theology and scripture and God's word, but I don't know what I don't know yet. And I, I haven't mastered these books. There's 66 of them. I always ask God, God, what don't I know that I need to know? It's a big deal. And so that's part of my growth journey. What don't I know that I need to know? And I'm going to invite you, if we're going to be growing in Christ, effective ministers, to love God better, to love our neighbor better, what do I know that I know? What don't I know? Let's pray. Father God, uh, we're moving through heavy stuff. Uh, I do pray that there be a freedom of spirit, that we can ask questions, look to you for answers. God, uh, we want to grow, and we want to understand how change takes place and what I really need to address as I, as I grow. Uh, for your glory, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. It's break time.